Welcome to this edition of the Student Life Advisors Podcast. My name is Trey. I'm Elaine. And we are here today with our special guest, Ryan Kelly. Yay! Woo! <laughs> All right, so before we get into it, let me introduce our special guest. All right, Ryan Kelly is a $150,000 scholarship winner, debt-free college graduate, and scholarship expert, and coach. In 11th grade, she began applying for a variety of scholarships while figuring out winning techniques and strategies through trial and error. Now, Ryan shares scholarship opportunities and hacks on TikTok at ryan.kel and coaches families through the step-by-step -step process of finding, applying for, and winning scholarships in her signature coaching program, Get Paid to Go to College. Ryan is here today. Yeah, we're definitely going to cover a lot about scholarships today. We're super excited. I don't know if you guys follow Ryan on TikTok, but it's a blast. She is. She's got all the energy. I don't know how she has the energy every time. I'm like, whoa, my goodness! Like every video, I'm engaged. I want to learn more. There's a great tip in there, and there's even specific scholarships she points out right on that TikTok. I'll tell you this: I'm not in college anymore, but she's taught me some things. Yes. Okay. She's yeah. taught me some things too. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here with you today and chat about scholarships because there's just so much out there, and uh, we're excited to get that in the hands of students. And so we're going to be talking about scholarship tips that actually work. Yes, because there's so many out there, right? There are so many out there. There's a lot of websites out there, a lot of information, overwhelming, and, and a lot of other aspects. Another thing yeah. is, you, we kind of live in a day where everybody's an expert. I'm glad we get to talk to a real expert, somebody yes. who's tried and tested, been through the process, actually has some some data behind their tips if you know and I'm, I'm talking about hundred fifty thousand dollars in scholarships worth of advice i mean i i can't argue with that so ryan why don't you tell us how you got started on TikTok and a little bit about your journey about getting hundred fifty thousand dollars in scholarships and graduating debt free because that's just amazing well, thank you. I'm, I'm so excited to be with you both here and chat about scholarships. And my ultimate goal is just to help students and parents realize that this isn't some pie in the sky, impossible thing. I wasn't a valedictorian or quarterback on the football team. <laughs> Do I look like it? I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't who you think is going to be a full ride $150,000 scholarship winner. And so what I want students and parents to know the most is it's possible as long as you know the right steps. And for me, when I was getting started, it was right between 10th and 11th grade when basically my parents sat me down. I'm like, okay, this looks like it's going to be a serious conversation. <laughs> and they say, Ryan, we know you want to go to college and we want you to go to college, but we can't pay for it. And we don't want you to take out loans. So we're going to have to figure something else out. Now, for me, being 10th grade, college felt eons away, right? <laughs> but I could tell there was a seriousness to this and that I needed to probably get going. So I applied to my first scholarship right between 10th and 11th grade. It was, you guys, $100 is what I want. Wow. Oh, $100. You know, some people would look at a $100 scholarship and say, it's not even worth putting my name down. Mm -hmm. but you know, what people don't yep. realize, especially if you start early, is $100 now and keep earning $100 every few months, that starts to add up really fast. Wow. Really fast. Well, what that said to me was, okay, $100, why can't I get $1,000? Why can't I get $10,000? And so that's really where it all began. And I actually got $0 of help from FAFSA which I know for a lot of families, when they see that number, that senior year of high school thinking, oh, well, if we don't get any money from FAFSA, that must mean we can't qualify for any other scholarships. But that's just not true. I'm so glad I kept going. So kept working on it, trial, trial and error, figured out what worked. I applied all the way through my senior year of college. And then that's how I ultimately won over 150,000. It was $164,000 to be exact that covered everything and helped me graduate debt free. Wow. Okay, I didn't know that you continue to apply for scholarships even after being in college. That is a pretty interesting 
fact because I don't I think when you when people get in college oftentimes it's easy to just I'm say done. I'm done I made it I made it but that's not only, only one that, bill yeah and then not <laughs> only that you think oh well I didn't maybe I wasn't able to get the aid coming into college my freshman year so I'm just doomed and you oh wow the fact that you kept applying even while you were in college and that eventually allows you to amass 164,000. Correction, folks, it's not 150, it's $164,000 in scholarships. Oh my goodness, that, that's, that's incredible. So 10th, 11th grade, where did you even think to look? Like, where were you even thinking to find a scholarship? Like, that's the biggest question. It's like, where do I even get started? And I wasn't looking that hard in 10th, 10th grade, if, I'm, if we're going to be honest. <laughs> I need some of, those, some of those tips right there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the interesting thing about scholarships is there's a couple different types. And I know we all think of the scholarships that come from the college that you're going to ultimately attend, right? That financial aid, that merit gift aid, which is fantastic. And you're typically going to get that during your 12th grade year. But how you can actually get scholarships as young as 9th, 10th, 11th, or even while you're in college is actually seeking out those scholarships. And this is what I did from private third party sources. So think about businesses, associations, organizations, what these groups are is they genuinely want to help students. They want to support education. They want to encourage students in their country or in their area to uh, pursue that, have the encouragement towards that. And so you will see scholarships from all different types of places. And the crazy thing about these scholarships for you know, people wondering, how do you even start in ninth, 10th, 11th grade? You have no clue where you're going to college yet. You have no clue what you're going to major in you don't have to know those things. So there are scholarship contests where they are not asking you those questions. Instead, it's just, okay, uh, submit a short essay about this topic or submit your res resume and your accomplishments thus far in ninth and 10th grade. Uh, enter into this video contest or this poster contest where any student can do that. And in many of these contests, I've seen there be multiple winners, multiple prizes, and it really gets students thinking ahead. And the great thing is, if you're a 10th grader or 11th grader like me winning that money, you just get to save that and then use it wherever you go down the line of college. I had no clue where I was going to go, but I knew I had $3,000 so far in savings that I could use anywhere. That's great advice. Just, you know, kind of look, look at some of your local stuff, third parties, and find it. So. You know, let's dive into like, let's go over like five top tips that you have because you have a lot of experience. You've done a lot of different things. Let's go over your top five tips. I think that's what a lot of people want to hear is what should I be doing? What really works? Like, how do I stand out? Because you kind of feel like sometimes you're just another number submitting and you don't really know what happens. But how do you make yourself stand out? How do you actually win these scholarships? So what would you say is your one of your top five tips? One of my top five tips actually would pertain to that eligibility all through college. So everybody's focusing on scholarships during senior year of high school, which is great, right? It's top of mind, but competition is toughest then. Everybody's thinking about it. If you're starting now, whether you're in ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, or you're already in college, college freshman, college sophomore, college junior, competition is so much lower for those opportunities because a lot of people don't realize they're out there. So just by applying during those years of your life, you are already setting yourself up for success and giving yourself a much higher chance of winning because of the lower competition numbers. And not only that, now you have more time. You've established some time there. You know, we kind of try to reach some of our, you know, customers and people who visit our sites like scholarshippoints.com because you can be as young as 13. And we always try to push that. Like, you don't need to wait. And then usually, you know, I get that email or someone coming in through Ask the Advisor saying, you know, I'm going to start school next month. Um, I need some scholarships because they didn't give me enough financial aid. And they're like, do you think I can win some right now? And I'm like, okay, you've really limited yourself. I'm not saying there is zero opportunity, but you've given yourself no time to one, do the applications, get them in, let the, the submission period actually end. Cause you know, we have to wait and kind of do it based on the terms and conditions of the scholarship provider. 
and then for them to choose the winner and then to give the money. So you've kind of like really narrowed down your time. If you're starting super early, you're giving yourself so much time. And you know, I think a lot of people worry of like, well, wh where does that money go? What do I do with that money that I earned? And as, as a ninth grader, 10th grader, I know we personally kind of work with the student to get it into a free college savings plan if possible. Um, we have other terms and conditions that we kind of follow to help make sure that that money is used for college. But have, has that been your experience as well? Is like you just, the people who start the earliest have the easiest time winning scholarships? Definitely. The more time you give yourself, the less stressful it's going to be, the more opportunity that's going to be out there. And you just give yourself more time to get used to the system. If I see students starting, you know, March of their senior year of high school, and it's a huge learning curve. It's not surprising that they feel so overwhelmed just because you're learning how to craft a scholarship essay and market yourself. You're trying to figure out, okay, what opportunities fit me? And that's a lot to do in a small amount of time, which is why I say, you know, start now, even if you're out of high school and you're in college, most scholarship winners I speak to who have paid for college entirely through scholarships, we're still applying during their college years. That's kind of one of those big secrets of, it's not like it's over. It's not like you're locked into the funding you have once you set foot on campus as a freshman. Mm. Take advantage of whatever time you have left. There were even times where I was able to increase my financial aid at my college just by going there in person and talking to them as a sophomore or a junior. Hey guys, just saying hi again. You know my face by now. <laughs> if there's any scholarship money. And I was able to increase my scholarships that way, be the first to know about opportunities. So finding opportunities, thinking outside the box in that way and being persistent is going to be one of the best ways of approaching this. I know a lot of students look around and they're like, well, I don't see other kids doing this. So that probably doesn't work. Well, most students don't really know what to do when it comes to scholarships. So that's why I'm just trying to say, hey, start somewhere, apply whatever age you're at and be persistent in those opportunities. That's a great tip. Mm -hmm. that, that's an incredible tip because I can just totally understand where you're coming from. And I'm imagining people that I went to school with. And honestly, after we got into college, we stopped searching for scholarships. We thought that you have to get as many scholarships as you can by the time you step foot on campus as a freshman. And then after that, that's it. But it's so interesting to hear you attest to no. I was in the financial aid office. I was in that building every year asking them about scholarships and seeing which ones I'm eligible for even after the fact. I think that's a great tip. And if some of the listeners started doing that now, they'd be surprised what maybe $500 here or $1,000 there could do. That's a great tip. Great tip. Yeah, I have families email me say, you know what? We walked into that financial aid office or my student did just to ask. And now they have $5,000 more they didn't have before. And so as I tell students or parents, the worst that happens is nothing changes. It's just a the no. The answer is no, no, or you don't get the scholarship. The best that happens is you get an extra 5K, 10K that you don't have to pay back in loans. So honestly, it's a win-win in either situation. You might as well give it a shot. I like that. The worst that can happen is nothing changes. <laughs> oh, that's great. They're not going to say we're taking away your money now. They're just going to leave it alone and say, sorry, not this year. And then you just kind of move on and plan better for next year. The worst is no change. That's good. We need to put that on a t-shirt, Ryan. You get, you gotta, I, I love it. I love to see that in the next, in the next video, <laughs> your, your next TikTok. It's, it's, Hey, the worst that happens is nothing changes. Just go and ask. Let's see what happens. <laughs> that is awesome. Just go for it. We already have two t-shirts in the making. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We, we need some more now. I know. We need some more. So that's a great tip. Start early. Keep applying even when you're in college. So what would you say is your top four tip of helping like apply to scholarships and win scholarships? Absolutely. So one other tip that I would say in, in our top ones going forward is a lot of students think that grades are everything. Grades are not everything when it comes to scholarships. And I see a lot of students say, well, if I don't have a 4.0 or if I don't have a 3.8, why should I even try? Mm. And students, parents, wherever you're at in grades, that is just small percentage of what they're taking into account. 
how judges actually evaluate who their winner is, is based off of your response in the essay and your extracurriculars, your volunteers, and that you've written down. So if I've seen 3.0s beat out 4.0s, just because they were the ones who were getting out there in their community or staying involved in the club, taking on a leadership position. So don't discount those things that you are doing outside of the classroom, outside of homework time, because that's actually where you can solidify your win. So I've heard parents even say, well, my students have been set back by COVID. I just feel like there's not a lot of extracurriculars. There weren't a lot of volunteer opportunities. Keep in mind, Everybody experienced that. So the, the, the playing field is leveled, mm. but this is actually an opportunity for students to really stand out. So get out there. You know, if you love, I, I, I love this example. Like if you love baking cookies that you just love it, it's not like you're going to culinary school, bake cookies and take them to some veterans organizations around town. Do something with what you love Turn that into some way to serve somebody else because that's what judges love to see. So you put that on your application. This is my service. I took initiative. I did this. And that's what judges love because they ultimately are investing in you with a scholarship. It's kind of like, it's like, right? Where the sharks are investing, deciding how to invest in a business. And so these scholarship judges are determining which student they're going to invest in. And a student who shows potential initiative, even in small ways, is exactly the type of student they're going to choose. So those small things matter. You don't have to be this, you know, 4.0 student saving the world. Why don't you just start by blessing some neighbors or people around you? That's exactly what judges want to see. And, you know, I think that's one of the biggest things that kind of is off-putting is sometimes students feel like I'm not exceptional enough. I didn't do anything that really stands out. And in all honesty, our experience is the winners, you know, if not all scholarships are even asking you GPA, they're not asking you information about how successful you're in school. They just want to know a little bit more about you and the fact that you're applying, you know, you show an interest in wanting to go to school and they're trying to see if they want to invest in you. Like several years ago, we actually did a, a, an essay scholarship. Most oh yeah. Our scholarships aren't. And one of our winners actually, um, she had an interesting story, you know, it was an obstacle about like, she needs money for school, but you know, so is everyone else who's applying for the scholarship. They need money for school. She didn't start off that way. She was explaining about some of like her life, some of like the obstacles she has in her family and how she found a way to earn money by doing something she loves, which is making homemade pickles. Yeah, she would deal pickles. And selling them. And that's how she started earning some money for college, her initiative. She had an interesting story where like her family just couldn't really like they couldn't afford for her to have a car. They lived in an area where she couldn't walk to any job. So she found a way to earn money with the resources she had. And she was doing something she loved, which is a very unique thing. I don't know many picklers. No, <laughs> no, I, no, I, no, I don't. So she really stood out. And you know, we don't, I couldn't tell you what her GPA is. We weren't really concerned about it. She stood out so much to us that we were like, you know, she has to be the winner of our scholarship. And I think that's great advice is like, you don't always have to be exceptional. Personally, I got some scholarships and I didn't think I was gonna qualify for anything. And it came down to the fact that I had earned a significant money working a part-time job my senior year, because they kind of asked and they were like, wait, you're a senior in high school. How were you able to earn this? I'm like, I worked every hour I could. I worked weekends. I took time and a half on Sundays. You know, it was just a retail job. But that was enough to show, like, I have some initiative, a drive, and I want to be independent and work towards myself. And that's what they were looking for. I didn't know that when I applied. They didn't say we're looking for independent people who earn money their high school year. I just kind of put it on there thinking, oh, I'll just it's a fact. We'll throw it on, see what happens. And it worked. Yeah, that's such it's, a good point. Yeah, the th it's crazy how the things that you or a student take for granted are typically gonna be the things that impress a judge the most. Like you doing that extra part-time work or this young lady pickling things and selling them, <laughs> you know? It's just your life, it's what you do. And yet that is what stands out to the judges the most. And I tell students this, if there is one thing that you can brainstorm to put on your applications, it's how you're spending your time personally, talents, interests, skills outside of school. So are you, and I'm, I'm even talking about things outside of school clubs, just things you do on your own time, 
because that's what says the most about you and where your values lie. And there's nothing else that gives judges more insight into who you are and will compel them more to choose you as the winner. So I think you, Elaine, you were doing that without even realizing it. (laughs) Yeah, it was one of those things that I didn't know. Um, Fortunately, I waited for high school senior year. Oh. Ah. (laughs) But luckily I had a lot of local scholarships, which I know is unique, significant amount of local, just for my school district, really small like town in Massachusetts, dual county, so it's two towns, not a lot of competition. And I just kind of was like, I meet the qualifications, I'll fill out the application and write the essays and see what happens, you know? Well, that's another tip too. And oh. you see, you had something <laughs> in Elaine where you had it in you without even realizing it. You just went for it. And it worked out. But that's what some students need to hear is focus locally. This is another tip. Focus locally because the competition is always going to be more limited. If you're applying to a national scholarship that everybody knows about, competition is just too high. Like I went for a very well-known national scholarship, lost, was devastated, thought that I was not born a scholarship winner and I needed to give this up. My mom says, Ryan, Ryan, listen to me. The, The competition was high. So I think this is more of a competition problem than it is a you problem. And I needed to hear that. I really needed to hear that. And so then when I started going for these local contests, where, you know, I don't know how many people you competed against, Elaine, but typically I was maybe only competing against five or 10 kids. In some cases, no one else applied. So you're the winner by default. Oh, but that's goodness. A- yep. Yeah, so my <laughs> my personal experience was, it was through my high school, you had a list of forms. It did have some income cutoffs. Um, so that limited the field even more, but it was just my graduating class. And I think we had about 400 um, with a limited field. So I remember the award ceremony. I won five scholarships. And everyone's like, what did she do? Because, you know, like, if you go, like, to the same school with the same kids your whole life, the same people, every time it's award time, it's the same five, ten people who get called for everything. Then all of a sudden, I'm getting called for everything. And everyone's like, what did she do? And I'm like, I filled out the application. <laughs> like, I, I was sitting there like, I honestly don't really know what to tell you. I, I did the application. I met the qualifications. I answered the questions honestly. Um, I don't know how many people actually applied and people are like, what application? So, I mean, that just tells you (laughs) that it was a really limited playing, like limited field. So super helpful for me, even though I kind of did a little last minute. Um, and I didn't even know these existed until my senior year. You got to take those wins, whether you got major competition, you know, less competition or by default competition, whatever it may be, it you've got to take those wins. So that's that's such a good point because I think Ryan brings up a good point, which is that when we think about these scholarships, we think about those nationally competitive awards where fifty thousand dollar scholarships, the twenty five thousand dollar scholarships, out of everyone. And if you want to be one of those individuals taking home that $25,000 scholarship, I mean, you're competing with thousands, I mean, tens of thousands of applicants. And, and sometimes, I don't maybe in some cases, maybe 100,000 applicants and for some of those awards. So you're, I, I like that idea of focusing locally and, hey, getting in front. And if nobody else applies, so be it. So Why be it. not? Some, it's there for somebody, so if they're going to give it to you, why not? I'm not I gonna take say it. No. I take it. I'm not going to say no to a scholarship opportunity that that nobody else applied for. No. I'm taking it. Ryan obviously took them, you know. So <laughs> if we're following, if we're following her her example, then hey, you better take them too. I would. Thank you for getting to this point in the podcast. As you know, we give out a bonus code with every episode. Use the code Ryan Kelly for 100 points on scholarshippoints.com. Remember, you can use those points to enter into exclusive scholarships only available on the website. Once again, use the code Ryan Kelly. That's R-Y-A-N-K-E-L-L-Y. Now let's get back to the podcast. All right, Ryan. So we got another tip. Which, what, what do you have on your list for us? So I, another tip I have is set aside the time. I think a lot of people think, oh yeah, scholarships, <laughs> I'm going to work on them at some point, right? Oh yeah, I'll do that next week. Well, 
I don't know about you, but if it's not on my planner or not on my calendar, it doesn't exist. <laughs> so same thing with scholarships, because if you're going to be serious about winning thousands of dollars, you need to be serious about showing up for that and setting up the time. And I'm not saying that you make this your whole life and it takes over all your time, but just by even doing one to two hours a week, I tell families, you know, make that a fun time. It's Thursdays, three to five after school, you make some snacks, you sit down and you just work on those scholarships that are coming up soon. Make it fun. Have a friend come over, work on the same scholarship. Uh, it doesn't matter what you do. Just make sure that it happens because otherwise you will find yourself waking up one day realizing, oh my goodness, I just missed four of those deadlines I meant to apply for, but I didn't sit down and do it. And the worst time to hear that is they already started or they did the work or the essay and time got away from them. And I'm like, no, because I mean, time is super important when it comes down to this because you're trying to win money. But another way to think about it, it's also earn money. It's very few things in life that you earn money without spending any time to get that money. What a point, Elaine. <laughs> so it's just one of those things where, you know, we emphasize that quite a bit. I emphasize it. We've done a few Facebook Lives where I'm like, you know, it is a bit of a job. It doesn't have to be, you know, a full-time job, but you do have to put the hours into it to have some sort of payoff. You can't just click here and it's all done. I mean, at least you have an application form. That's going to take a few minutes, even if it's a no essay scholarship or that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And with the timing too, I like to think about it kind of like a part-time job, like you were saying. And that was something my mom told me. Hey, let's treat this like a class. Let's treat this like a part-time job. It's going to help us take it more seriously. It's going to help you take it more seriously. But then also we can calculate the payoff. Sometimes when students can really evaluate the dollar signs, it's motivating. And when it comes down to winning scholarships, let's say you win a thousand dollar scholarship that you spent five hours on, you just got paid $200 an hour. Ooh. When you break that down, find me a high school or college job that's gonna pay you that well. I'll wait. <laughs> that's not gonna happen. I can't think of any. <laughs> I got nothing. And even when you're losing scholarships, it's not like you win every single one. I didn't win every single one. It's, you know, win some, lose some, win some, lose some but those wins will still make up for those losses. So it's not something to worry about. You get better with time uh, and you can reuse a lot of your materials. That's probably one other tip I wanted to share as well is reuse, save what you write. Um, a lot of applications are asking for the exact same things. Judges are looking for the same type of material. So before clicking submit on some online application that's gonna gobble up your answer that you can never see again, save that to a Google doc have those resources so that the next time you come up on an application, oh, you might be able to copy and paste or tweak a little bit and then finish that in under 30 minutes, who knows? And you know what, I went on a Ryan Kell rabbit hole. I watched, I think, every TikTok you have. And I think one of the points you drive home that was so fantastic to me, which I think I understood and knew, but I just never really saw it written down, is there's only really three types of essays you'll kind of come across as the most common essays out there. So could you give us a little preview of what yeah, those- Yeah, what are those would, three? Those, those three, three. because I think that is so incredibly valuable and helps with reusing some of your work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, well, Elaine, I'm so honored that you watched my TikTok. <laughs> I, I saw them too. <laughs> <laughs> you came prepared, you know exactly what to chat about. With those, those topics, it's so true. When you get down to the topics for scholarship essays, it can seem like there's a lot. But at the end of the day, judges are really just asking the same base question, which is, why do you deserve the scholarship? Why should we give you the scholarship? That doesn't have to be an intimidating question. They want you to brag about yourself. So, you know, don't, don't let your inhibitions go. And this is usually found in three main prompts. So the first is going to be that career goals essay. What are your goals? Why do you wanna to go to college? Tell us about that. The next one's going to be about your extracurriculars, your past experience. So what have you been involved with? What have you been spending your time on? How have you been growing as a person? And then that final one is a combination of all those things. I call it the personal statement. So it's kind of a recap of where you've been, where you're going. But if you realize they're really trying to boil it down to your past, your future. What have you done? What's your potential? Same thing with how a 
you know, investor might evaluate how they're going to invest in a certain business. They want to know what are your stats and what do you predict is going to be your potential revenue down the line? Or, you know, when there was just the NFL draft, right? They're looking at the stats. What were it, what was it for those players? How do we think they're going to contribute to our team? And will they be a good investment? Same thing with these essays. You get the chance to say, this is what I have done. This is what I want to do. And something that most people forget to include, which is going to be one of your biggest assets, is tell a story about yourself. Tell me a story about what was that leadership experience like, rather than just telling me, hey, yeah, I led the photography club. Tell me about when you set up that weekend workshop at the park, invited all the club members and allowed them to really sharpen their skills. Give us a story, no matter what prompt you're answering. But those are, I would say, the three main things that you're going to come across. And it kind of made me laugh when I saw that video, because when we were coming up with the prompts for our scholarship essay, we were trying to like be a little out of the box. And I was like, oh, no, we weren't. <laughs> it fell right into one of those, you know, some of the obstacles that you faced that you overcame to get to where you want to go. So that's kind of where we're going there of like, explain to us why you deserve the money and tell us something pretty unique that was an obstacle that you had to overcome. So it falls right into, you know, kind of your past experience and it's the combo of bringing you into, you know, what you want to do with your life and how you'll use those funds. So it was kind of interesting. Yeah, and I like how Ryan breaks it down and you make it so simple and how it's not about hey, I did these things. You really want to tell that story because we go back to all of those essays that we read for that competition. And what was the, the essays that stood out? They, they all just had compelling, interesting stories that made you look beyond the GPA or whatever the, the normal things that you look at with a scholarship essay. It was those not only the extracurricular activities, but the creative ways they were going about to overcome those obstacles. And, and you make such a good point. You can take something, something like leading a photography club and dress it up in such a way that it demonstrates more than, hey, I just led the club. Because sometimes how you tell the story is some, is, can be more impactful than the specific thing that you did in the story. Yeah. And I think it definitely prepares you for college time. Like if you're doing this in ninth, 10th grade, guess what your college essays are like? They're like, tell us something about yourself, a personal statement, some of your goals. All of that. And if you're already doing that and you're in the habit of writing it, because I'm actually a little bit more of a, believe it or not, timid person. <laughs> I don't, I have a hard time with reviews. I had a hard time with essays that were personal statements because I always kind of feel like, mm, it's not that like great like it is what it is like I did what I did and it life goes on but you kind of have to get used to it, especially if you're like me to get out of that bubble and get yourself to actually brag about yourself or at least write it in a way that it's compelling and it's creative because if you're doing that ninth tenth grade you have plenty of practice before you have to apply to college and they're looking for similar type of stories and guess what if you're admitted and you you kind of stood out in the application you might see some merit aid or some other type of assistance from your school if you're standing out because they want you to attend. Oh, yes. So true. Elaine, you totally, totally hit the nail on the head right there. It's so true. And even in some cases, you can reuse your scholarship essays as college admissions essays. I did that in a couple circumstances. So it was just the gift that kept on giving, kept on giving, <laughs> you know, the scholarship once, and then it got me scholarships later or more merit aid down the line. So it's so, it's so true. And when you touch on the obstacles portion, which is absolutely included in that past experience of, you know, what, what the judges want to see from you, uh, Ultimately, you know, with all of these essays, they want to see how you grow, right? And even if that is in a small way, I bet that young lady who wrote about her pickles business probably maybe second guessed herself, oh, does, is this too weird to write about? And yet that's exactly what stood out. And she used that to show her growth. Despite the obstacles that she had, she grew regardless. And so it kind of all links back. And I think we can tend to overcomplicate it but your own experiences matter, your own achievements matter, and they may seem simple to you, but it's a $10,000 story to a scholarship judge. 
And that's worth a lot of money then if it's a ten thousand dollar story. <laughs> but what Ryan's saying, you might not know it's a ten thousand dollar story. You, have you to might try. not know. It you have to be. try. And I mean, like you said, you can reuse your essays, but you know, if you're using the same essay and it's not giving you results, then maybe you know now time to tweak it. Time to add yep. a little bit more, maybe go a different direction. It's not quite working. But if you're giving yourself time, because that was the top, one of the first tips we talked about, then you have time to tweak it and keep trying and keep going to see what really resonates with a judge. Absolutely. Some of my essays flopped. So then I tried something else. <laughs> and then once I got that, I ran with it. <laughs> nice. Oh, my goodness. So when you talk about your essays and how you had this core group, you had this foundation of essays and then you're spending, I think you said like 30 minutes modifying it a bit to then adjust it for this particular scholarship. I mean, how much time did it take you to get, get those essays fine tuned for, for those who are listening and thinking, okay, I know I need three good essays. What, what was the investment there on your part? I'm glad you asked that, Trey, because I'll be completely honest with you. I still have those essays on my computer and I have them marked down with the number of drafts that I had. Wow. That main essay that I used, I had 11 drafts, 11. And that sounds like a lot. I spent two months working on that and it took some time, which would sound probably pretty intimidating to people. But the thing is, I did that for two months. I really got it down to where I wanted it the 12th time around. But then I used that for so many scholarships for about six years, all the way into college. And that one essay earned me, it was, I think over $60,000 from that one essay. Whoa. So the toughest part was in the beginning, but it paid off. Wow. Those are numbers. We if, like numbers. If you told me <laughs> that I had to work on an essay for two months and then that could possibly turn into not even $60,000, $5,000, I'd be satisfied. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. That is, that, but that's, that's a very practical tip that I think is, is good for a listener, for, for someone who's in high school or even college to think like, okay, what's the investment here? Eight. 12 drafts, two months, and then look at the dividends that paid. Wow. Awesome. Don't be afraid to edit. It's not fun. And it's not fun when someone else edits your paper either. There were a lot of red pen marks from my mom and some mentors. And critique is always going to be tough to accept, but it is worth it. And it will build you up into a better writer. I wasn't a naturally gifted writer. I do want to clarify that because I think some people say, oh, you know, she must have been super talented at this. My sister was born to write. Let me tell you, like it was crazy how good she was. She would write short stories in her spare time. And so I am sitting next to Shakespeare and it happens to be my sister who's two <laughs> years younger than me. And I'm feeling really down. I'm thinking I'm the one who gets worse grades on my papers, but with scholarship essays, I eventually realized, you know what, this isn't a school essay. I may not be great at research papers or writing essays like they want me to in school, but I can talk conversationally, write conversationally, you know, at least muster up a story. And that ended up being exactly what scholarship judges wanted to see. So one other bonus tip to throw in there, I see a lot of students who are writing school essays day in, day out. So they just kind of robotically translate that format to their scholarship essays. But that's not what is going to fly. Uh, I see probably if I'm if I'm judging a contest, 80 to 90 percent of the students will start their essay off by restating the prompt. Oh, no. That's big no, no. <laughs> it just doesn't stand out. I tell students the most valuable real estate that you have is that first line because that's, that's going to loop the, the judge in. <laughs> yeah, it's going to loop the judge in. They want to keep reading. And so if you start off with something else, you know, even if it's a fun fact or asking a rhetorical question, but it's not restating the prompt, I'm listening and you're already going to be in the top 10% stack of students. So that's something to keep in mind as well. That's a great tip because learning how to academically write is one thing but learning yeah. how to write in conversation like we we have a whole like our advisors.com is basically a content site and we've learned you know to make sure it's conversational easy to read 
but it's like the same kind of thing. If you sound like too technical or you get too, I don't want to say bland, but I guess a little get bland. Too amp- academic, get too academic, maybe. Get too academic. You kind of start to lose people. And now you're talking about writing to an audience. If you keep in mind who your audience is with a scholarship essay, it's people who will be reading the same answer to the same question thousands of times. Yeah. I mean, we yep. thought we had a relatively small group, but we still had thousands of essays to go through. We read every single one. If you keep reading your prompt over and over, it sets the tone. It sets like the feeling of the judge of like where this is going. You know it might be, like you said, like the rest of them. And then all of a sudden you get that one story who just catches your eye and just wakes you up a little bit as a judge. <laughs> it wakes you up and it makes you read on and it makes you read the whole thing and absorb it all while some of the others could get a little lost because of that one first sentence. Absolutely. And you remember it. You know, a memorable application is going to be the one that judges choose. It's going to be the one that sticks in their mind. I think when a judge gets to the end of this, and, and you've probably felt this way, when you get to the end of reading the applications, you think, well, which one do I remember the most? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> so that plays into it for sure. So there's a lot of scholarships out there. There's a lot of information out there. Um, one thing we always kind of caution because there's a lot of sources. We've talked about third parties searching for it all. You know, the one thing I have to bring it up, I have a compliance background in financial aid, is sometimes some scholarships are way too good to be true. Sometimes they ask for information that is not really appropriate to be sharing. Um, so essentially what we're getting to is unfortunately exists out there, Ryan, I'm sure you have fallen into it or seen them and flagged them, but these scholarship scams. Scholarship scams. It's sad, but you know, people looking for money and looking to find money, there's thousands of people out there. So have you really run into that? Have you seen any red flags that you've come across that you've had to tell students, whoa, keep in mind a too good to be true might be a little too good to be true. And that's a great way of putting it. I have seen some of these. And what I will preface this part of our conversation by saying is, I do think that Gen Z, the current generation applying for scholarships, is very aware that scams can happen. I have never seen a group of students have their radars up so Mm. much, which is great because they're good at being alert, making sure that they're smart in what they're submitting their information for. And we'll get into some of what those tips are to avoid those scams. But what I have seen is almost it swing to the other side of the pendulum where students are so careful that they don't apply for legitimate scholarships because they didn't take that extra 60 seconds to vet, is this real? Is it not? Well, it was real, but they just presumed it wasn't and moved on and missed out on an opportunity. So I think there's some good ways of breaking down what's real, what's not. So you're not too extreme on either side of the spectrum. First is you should never, ever, 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 ever pay to apply to a scholarship. Yes. Like, oh, some application, pay 40 bucks. You know, that if you're submitting to an organization and they're asking for money to do that, that is not legitimate. Uh, scholarship money is free to win and earn. So that's an element that we want to be aware of. But now I'd say if people are doing scams on scholarships, they know that people have their radars up about paying to apply. So what they're doing instead is trying to data mine and gather information. So if you're on an application and it's asking you for lots of sensitive information, so it's all about your home address and your phone numbers. Oh, and then maybe they're asking for your social security number, but there's not really anything that's application-based like application answers, maybe a short essay prompt. That looks a little shady, right? So that's where you want to do your due diligence. Just take 60 seconds, hop online, see if it's a legitimate organization. What do other places say about this group? Um, Because you'll very quickly be able to figure out if it's real or not. Literally, I've used Reddit forums (laughs) because some people be like, yeah, I looked into this. This is a scam. And that was a quick way for me to evaluate if the opportunity was real or not. And the last thing is, If you are focusing on applying to only nationally open scholarships, you're going to come across more of those opportunities that aren't as legitimate. So think about it this way. Put yourself in the shoes of a scammer. It's not worth the scammer's time to have a scholarship that's just open locally to one town. (laughs) No. Versus a scholarship 
to the whole country, right? They are here to be efficient. They want to scam a bunch of people. So if you are applying locally or even statewide, way less chance that it's going to be shady just because it's not worth the scammer's time. But the last thing uh, I'll say to this too is a winner's list of scholarship winners, always a great sign. If that organization has listed, okay, here are people who we've awarded scholarships to, great sign that that is a legit scholarship. But a really good fail safe is if you create a separate email to funnel all your scholarship applications to, Mm. that ensures that your primary email is not out there getting sold, being distributed. I actually tell students, you know, Gmail's free, create a Gmail account ryan scholarships at gmail.com and then just use that email address for everything you apply to keeps it all in one place and then separates it from your primary inbox good or bad yeah those are all fantastic tips and essentially you know if you ever come across a scholarship that's asking you to pay or share information that you're a little confused about like bank account information Whoa. which is out there never think twice before oh. you share information that'll give direct access to your identity or your funds, <laughs> your money. Because, you know, a lot of these scholarships, they're gonna be asking information about you as far as your name, maybe your date of birth, year in school, and then providing some sort of essay. It's pretty general, the information that they're asking about you to get an idea of who you are. They're not gonna go as far into as saying like, well, I need to know what bank you bank with. They're not gonna, they don't need to know that. No. That's not the information they need to deal with. And as long as you're working with a reputable company, you should be good to share information after you've won as far as getting that the money to you. But be careful if something seems off or a little bit not right, it's definitely worth it to do the research. You're doing the research to find the scholarships anyways you might as well make sure it's a scholarship you want to apply to. I agree. I agree. And I like that tip too of of looking for that winner's list. If you, if you see the winner's list and these are individuals who received that scholarship, then you can have some more assurance that this is a legitimate scholarship. These individuals have won this scholarship. This is how much money they've earned. And then you can connect the dots there as well. Because yes, if you've got some scholarship that's out there and nobody's winning it, well then, hey, I I don't know. (laughs) Yep, so true. Ryan, you have been fantastic. There is so much information in this one episode. I'm so excited for everyone to listen to it. Um, Obviously, we'll be posting this to our YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So leave comments on the platforms that you can. We'd love to hear your feedback. Ryan, tell us a little bit about where people can find you and get additional tips that you share. Absolutely. So I am very active on TikTok. That's one of the best places to get scholarship recommendations from me, scholarship tips and strategies, really keep up to date with the resources out there. So I am ryan.kel on TikTok, R-Y-A-N dot K-E-L. And we have a blast over there on TikTok. I love answering questions there. So if you have a question about something, drop a comment on one of those videos. Another way to reach me is through my website, scholarshipnavigator.com. And I host free classes for parents. I coach families through my Get Paid to Go to College coaching program where we meet once a month. We go more in depth. We get families on board and my students are winning thousands of dollars, which is so, so exciting. So family seeking more assistance, I offer that too. But those are the best places to find me online and on socials. Oh, yes, we definitely got a link to that in the description for the podcast and on the and on the video as well. This has been phenomenal. I don't I don't have another word for it. This is awesome. Ryan's been educating us. I know she's been educating me, giving me some some tips. I'm like, maybe I need to go back to college just so I can get some scholarships. (laughs) Find a way to pay for college for free. (laughs) Right, right. You got some grad school tips? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Hey, they're out there. Grad school scholarships are out there. It has been a treat chatting with you both. And just however we can get this info out to students and empower them to get scholarships and hopefully even graduate debt free. That's what we're trying to all do. Seriously. That's the goal, right? That's the goal.